session where I'm going to show you relationship dynamics and things that bring you together, the things that tear you apart, the things that you can't see. A lot of the times when you're de dealing with relationship problems, it always feels like it's the other person's fault. And you can always see what they're doing and you can very rarely understand what they're doing. So you need to be able to see, you know, the, the, arrow, the arrows and the little diagrams and the sticky pole will really help you. Um, even watching the, the energy move from one person to the other really help with that. Um, because there's a massive misunderstanding in the spiritual community about how energy moves in an intimate relationship. Now, in non-intimate loving relationships, mostly the energy is from the higher chakras. Okay? That's how it works. The moment you get into intimate and sexual relationships, mostly the energy is coming from the lower chakras. Okay? And that's absolutely normal. This is how we get, we have such strong, this is exactly why we feel attracted to somebody and we have that sexual desire shoot up from the pit of our stomach. That's the activation of the lower chakras. That's it connecting to the other person's energy field. And that's you, you literally, your energy body starting to read their energy field and figure out if they're the right person, literally, for your highest self-actualization and for your growth. Because that isn't really figured out through the higher chakras. That's figured out through your family imprinting. That's figured out through who you are on this planet as a human being. It's your divine humanness that that person is interested in. You do get that flash, and this is where the spiritual stuff is so important. When you meet somebody, you get that instant attraction. Or the first time, you, you know, I've known somebody for a while, but you start to feel that tenderness or that love towards them, and the, the energy matures. Um, that's literally when you get a glimpse of their spiritual perfection. You get a glimpse of that part of them that is perfect, that is whole, that is already perfect, whole, and complete, and an idea inside the mind of God. And that's the part that we tend to fall in love with. That's the love at first sight thing. That's the when we actually we really lose it and we go, oh my God, I can't believe this person is so perfect. And it's the first two years of every relationship, pretty much, that goes past the start point. Um, it's biologically studied over and over again in psychological studies. The honeymoon phase is normally the first two years. And it's literally, we get hit with such a high level of a variety of hormones um, which come from this spiritual connection. And a lot of people think that the loss of this, the passion in the relationship is about the loss of physical connection. There, it's the myth of um, my sex life has gone dead or we're just not really attracted to anymore. There's no spark or no chemistry there. We're like brother and sister man. Um, and they really think that if you know, if you go through the behaviors of you know, being behaving more romantically or going to bed together more or making love more, then that somehow they will get that intimacy back. And sometimes it works, but mostly it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because when you have the spiritual connection, which is what brings about that change in brain chemistry inside your neurology, it's natural that you're emotionally intimate. It's natural then to be physically intimate. When you're in that, when you're in that spiritual mysticism and in that spiritual romance, they transfer naturally down the different plethoras, and it's the, it's the easiest thing in the world. You can't imagine not making love with your partner. You can't imagine not spending every minute of every day with your partner. It comes naturally, you don't have to force it. When it's not there, everything seems like hard work. You, are, you suddenly start thinking, you actually expected me you know, to take all that time out instead of working, or instead of you know, um, being with the kids, or instead of, and it, it focuses right down to a point of, I don't understand how this person expects so much of my time or how much of my attention. And we, in our culture, it's been very much said, oh, that person is, what is that person not doing right? Or, how is the chemistry, you know, are they not meeting your needs sexually in the bedroom or is there something missing? And that's the opposite of what's happening. What's actually happening is the spiritual communion that at that really deep spiritual level is no longer happening. You are not feeling connected on a spiritual level. So then you're not feeling connected on an emotional level. So then you're not feeling connected on a physical level. And then even when you go to bed together, that chemistry, that passion, that desire, that my skin is on fire feeling, it isn't there. And it's got nothing to do with whether or not your partner is doing it right or getting his hands in the right place. That's why none of that stuff really matters in the beginning. And everything to do with that sense of being in that spiritual fire, that union. And spiritual soulmate relationships have two purposes. One is your own enlightenment and your self-actualization. 
The other is the enlightenment and self-actualization of another human being. And that's the truth. You know, a part of our soul always, always knew, it always knew that this person that was going to be given to us was an amazing gift. And that that gift that they are wasn't just given to us for our enjoyment. Because spiritual love is inclusive. It was given to us for our enjoyment, but also with the understanding that in our arms, that person would go into being the gift that they were capable of being for the world. And that is the part that gets left out of pretty much every single mass media representation of romance that happens in Western culture. The part that says we are the space, the relationship is the space, it's the temple of the divine in which you and the other person are literally self-actualizing. Now when you stop seeing the relationship as separate from your spiritual growth, and you start understanding that it is actually the space for your spiritual growth, it's the incubator, it's almost like the divine womb. If you read A Course in Miracles, they actually say the Holy Spirit is a relationship. They say it's not a body, it's not a mind, you know, it's not some, it's not an, it's not an idol. It is your relationship. And when you realize that that space is the space of enlightenment, that that is where you're going to self-actualize, then you realize, oh, that's why my stuff comes up here so much. Because it's natural that in the presence of love, everything that is not love-like will occur. All of your wounds will be brought to the surface. Now there's only two ways of looking at any particular situation. There is fear and there is love. Okay? Now, the price of one of seeing one world is the other. I cannot see my partner through eyes of love and still perceive him in fear. And I cannot see my partner through eyes of fear and still perceive them as unconditional love. So when you switch paradigms, as it were, when you're looking at your partner, you will lose the other perception of them, you will lose the other world in which they're in. Okay. Now, the ego, or the, which is, the ego, which literally is the thought in your head that believes that you are separate from the divine, from the whole, that you are separate from all of life, okay, it uses these areas in the relationship where our wounds come up to deepen the wound. That is what it would do. When you're in a fearful state of mind and these wounds arise in the relationship, and this is not an if, this is a when. It always happens, it's completely normal. It is literally why you are together. Because in order to heal, you need to first be able to see where your issues are so that you can ask for divine intervention on those issues. The universe will not interfere on your issues without your permission. And most of our issues are completely unconscious. We literally unconscious of our own consciousness of them. And that is where our partner, where our relationships, where the other aspects of God that is every single other human being in this room comes in. Because they will show us the same aspect of ourselves that we have difficulty processing over and over and over again. Okay. From the eyes of the ego, this is an attack. From the eyes of the ego, it means that this person is not right for us, that you know, we should really get out of there, that it isn't working. We're like, oh my god, all my stuff is coming up, I really shouldn't be with this person, it's driving me crazy. You know, it's all the time. You're thinking, this is a bad relationship, and God is thinking, this is good. This is really good. These people are really getting close to it here. And at the same time, and this is why so much drama comes up, at the same time, the ego is the closest that it will ever be to destruction when you are next to your beloved. Because the moment that you are literally in union of spirit, of emotion, of mind, of body, you lose all intellectual and physical boundaries to separation and you become one. When they say that Adam and Eve were naked in, in the Bible, they're not just talking about being physically naked, they're talking about being emotionally naked. They're talking about being spiritually naked. They're talking about all of our psychological masks being removed and us being able to be one. And that threatens the whole paradigm of fear. And that's why there's so much resistance in um, intimate relationships to experiencing intimacy on both halves. It's genuinely a holy space. And the resistance you experience is the fear of the ego of its destruction. Okay? Now, when you're 
seeing the relationship through eyes of love. It shifts from being a fearful relationship to being a holy relationship. This is the temple within which stuff comes up. So it's pretty much stuff comes up inside the relationship and you think, oh, right, this is what hospitals are for. <laughs> this is where we heal the things that are broken in ourselves and in each other. And you don't start to act like the person isn't good enough for you or you're not good enough for them because of your wounds. You go deeper into that state of presence and of literally of unconditional positive regard for your beloved because in that space that is where they are most likely to become who they really are. Now who they really are is unconditional love. So you don't have to worry that by unconditional loving them you're going to become a doormat. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is the exact opposite of that. If you literally unconditionally love somebody and you come from that space of unconditional love. And I'm not just talking about behavior. okay? And this is where we get stuck a lot of the time even when we're doing coaching work or when we're doing psychological work, because it's still only intellectual and behavioral. And I can very, very much, on the surface, be behaving perfectly, have no physical signs of aggression or irritation in any way, shape, or form, and I can be talking to you in a really lovely tone of voice and still be thinking, you are an absolute dick. Okay? Now, <clears throat> through metaphysical understanding, we know that all minds are joined. Okay? You cannot have a thought, you cannot have an energy system which the other person does not know that. And literally, this is why we need divine intervention. Because it's deeper than behavioral and intellectual change. We have to actually be different. We can't have those levels of, oh, because I am spiritual, then I'm going to behave like this. And of course in miracles, that's called forgiveness to destroy. It's when we're literally using our spirituality as a way of separating ourselves from others and of feeling superior to them. It's the only way is hell. Not just for the other person, but for ourselves. We start to feel like we're doing all this spiritual work and the other people just aren't vibrating at the same rate they were vibrating at. And we just can't seem to form a connection, which is what the whole of this is about, feeling connected. And of course the ego loves spirituality, it's the perfect hiding place. It's easy to hide behind lots of different spiritual constructs and lots of different intellectual concepts, especially psychological ones, that prevent you from getting to an unconditionally loving space. Now, literally, what happens when you love your partner unconditionally from that space is that anything that is not their true self, so anything that is not unconditional love, starts to melt away. It just starts to fall away. as literally as if um, literally all that's required for the darkness to disappear is the light to be switched off. Okay. Now, that is an amazingly powerful thing. The difficult thing about that is that in our culture we've confused neutral thoughts with loving thoughts. Okay. And your soulmate, they know when you're actually loving them and when you're feeling neutral about them. And that's when you, get, when you get used to someone, it's very easy to start having neutral thoughts about that person. But darkness is not necessarily aggressive in itself. Darkness is simply the absence of light. And that's all it takes for darkness to appear in, your, in the relationship. You don't even have to go to a place of being irritated with that person or mildly frustrated. All you have to do is be neutral. Neutral about the relationship, neutral about the situation instead of loving, and it's already dark in the room. Okay? So the moment I've gone from, this is an amazing, wonderful, lovely human being, our lovely divine child of God, to, yeah, you know, I think he's an okay person, the light's gone off. Okay? You may not have realized <coughs> the light's gone off, but consciously the light has gone off. That is not a loving thought. That is a neutral thought. Okay. And that is when the ego starts to go a bit crazy because you cannot see without love. Okay. And that, I'm, 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 I'm scared of doing this for one second, but we'll just give this as an example as if I do this. Okay. Now, I'm just going to do this for two other seconds. If I do that, and that's simple, but if I start having neutral thoughts about my partner, I can't actually see them. Okay. I think I can. I can make out things inside the room, I can make out silhouettes. But I cannot see clearly. If it wasn't early morning on a Saturday morning, it would be even harder to see in here. Does, does that make sense? Yeah? And when you can't see, 
you literally are making decisions from a place of darkness. It's the equivalent of me getting into my car at night in the countryside and driving around with no headlights on. So the moment you switch from a loving thought to a neutral thought about your partner, you switch the lights off. Okay? We all know this. We've all coasted. How many times have you been sitting there after you've been with somebody for a while and you're not really hearing what they're saying at all? You're completely in your head and you're thinking about your own life, your own issues, and you're not really present with what that person is saying or doing or feeling. You're in the neutral thought zone. You're not actively you know, upset at that person, you don't have any anger towards them, but you are neutral about them. You're not loving them in that moment. Okay? It's not possible to stop loving another human being and be loving yourself. So you haven't just left the relationship, you've left your own body, you've left your own presence. And I'm not talking about leaving in your body in the sense of having out-of-body experiences because that's a deeper level of presence than actually staying in your body. I'm talking about leaving your body in the sense of I've gone to conscious sleep. I am not aware anymore of what's going on in my relationship. And I'm not aware anymore of what's going on inside my life. And my true self, because my only true self, the only self with a capital S, because there's self with a small S, and self with a big S. Self with a big S is the unconditional love, the divine self, the God self. Self with a small S is ego self and individualized identified self. The sm self with a small S, the moment the neutrality is switched on and it comes in, that's when it takes over. And that's when you start looking at the other person and asking, are they meeting my needs? Are they good enough for me? Because the ego is a really, really tricky thing. It has at its disposal your mind. And your mind is a beautiful machine. Your intellect is an amazing thing. And the ego, just like the divine self, has at its disposal every single bit of intelligence that you have at its disposal. Now, you and I, if, if you've been in spiritual practice long enough, you know that it, the issue is not that you have wounds that need to be healed or that your partner needs to heal. The issue is that on the, at a soul level, there are no wounds and you have always been perfect, whole and complete. Okay? So there is no um, massive thing that's wrong with your partner. There is no massive thing that's wrong with you. The moment that you think that there is, it's because it's literally you've been sucked into the, the darkness part of it at the moment in time. Okay? Now, when you have these moments of intense separation, the ego doesn't say to you, oh, sweetheart, you know, you're one with all things. It doesn't say to you, it's all right. You know, there's nothing to be afraid of. You're away, but one with the ocean. It, wherever you go, the ocean goes. It says, with all the intelligence and shrewdness that it has, oh, sweetheart, there's somebody out there for you. There's one person out there who's just going to understand you and they're going to make all this pain, all this existential loneliness just disappear. Now, the reason that it says that is because it knows that if you were to know that your oneness with everything in the universe was what would heal you, then it would disappear. We're st it's still facing the death of the thought of separation. But if it gives you the, the idea that this one other person, this soulmate, is going to heal all of the hurt and all of the pain inside you, it knows two things. It knows firstly that you will remain feeling separate, and also that you are more likely to screw up the relationship with the person that you're in when you find them. Okay? So that's the two different ways of really understanding the relationship from a spiritual perspective versus from a fearful perspective. The spiritual perspective always says, knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you shall find. The ego, on the other hand, says, seek and do not find. It says, look for love and do not find it here. Look for love inside that person, inside the relationship, inside the world, and do not see it. And that is why the spiritual practice, the miracle itself, is a shift in perspective. A shift in perspective from looking at the world and not seeing the true divine nature of every single living thing to seeing everything as unconditional love. 
Now, there's a lot of different ideas about how many different kind of loves that there are. But ultimately, every single love is divine love. Now, of course, there are structures in intimate love relationships. You know, there's different structures for sexual relationships versus friendship relationships. Um, and we'll get into all of that stuff later on. You guys will be able to ask us, you know, as many questions and pick my and each other's brains as we do the exercises as you can. Right? But literally, what you're understanding is that what the ego will do is it will give you, and I, it, will, it, will, it will literally set up your poor partner for failure. Okay? And it will do that uh, very much so that you can then go, I try everything and it never works. So that you can go back into that space of separation and that feeling of maybe the next one. Maybe I'll figure it out with the next partner. Maybe this person isn't the right one for me. And that opportunity for your growth and for your healing will disappear. And that person will eventually disappear. Because if we're not there in our relationships, if we're not present, if our true self isn't really there, it's always only a matter of time before the relationship falls apart, before anything falls apart. Without the presence and proactive um, behavior of love, genuinely, all things hurt. It's like we have inner landscapes, and the divine, the spirit is the water. It's the rain clouds that come in and make everything green. And whenever we cut off those parts of ourselves, it becomes barren. That's why there's so many descriptions in all the different texts, whether it's Buddhists or um, Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism, about deserts. Deserts becoming oases. And they're not talking about real deserts. On, in the story, that's what it feels like, and you know we have areas of the planet where that's the case. But they're talking about our internal deserts, the spaces where we have become dead inside, the spaces where that unconditional love of spirit no longer reaches us in our interactions with others. And it's talking about wandering in those deserts and bringing those parts of us back to life and awakening. And that is what we're doing by starting with the spiritual practice before we go into the emotional and intellectual tool set that it takes um, to literally not just create a loving relationship, but create a relationship that deeply excites you and is more than you ever thought that it could be. A relationship that becomes a spark of light, that then inspires your family, your friends, your community. The kind of relationship that you actually dreamt about in your soul for so many lifetimes. And it's taken lifetimes. It's taken so many lifetimes to get to a point where we are ready to commit to unconditional love. Are we okay? Yeah, I'm just look at you. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's part of also what we're, what we're going to talk about today. Um, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of denial going on about just how deep our spiritual wounds are when it comes to healing them. Normally when you meet a soulmate, and I'm going to go into the types of soulmates in, in, in a second, um, what you don't realize is, is that you have met before. And when you met before, you had lessons to learn with that person before, and you probably made mistakes before. And even when those lifetimes with that person aren't particularly what's being triggered, or what's coming up. You have other systems at place from your family, from your ancestors, from the collective feminine masculine consciousness, which if they're unaddressed, interfere with the dynamics of unconditional love being able to be at play inside that relationship. And it's very, very, it, of course, in our society, we like the separation thing. So what we do is we compartmentalize everything. Um, ego is wonderful at doing this. It says it takes career, and it takes relationships, and it takes health, and it takes money, and it takes family, and it puts it all in all these really nice little boxes that we think that they're separate. But these things are all one. They are all 100% interconnected. If you are not nurtured in your relationships, okay, which started when your parents, who were soulmates, met, and literally procreated to conceive you, if they could not hold on to the spiritual oneness inside their practice, that is how you receive trauma inside the womb. That is how you receive trauma in your early childhood. And that is where your wounds come from. Okay? So you've got the, the family dynamic. If they don't have faith, 
faith in your ability to be who you really are, which is an unconditionally loving and proactive self. Faith in your ability to succeed through your career, through your relationships, through being who you really are, and they try and make you into who they need you to be so that they can love you. That's another layer of wounding that then gets added onto the process. And then, on top of that, when you go out into the world and you have friends in your adolescent years and then through university and then into the workplace, you have layers of social conditioning added on. Layer, other dances that you learn about how it's socially acceptable, what they call genderization, how it's acceptable to be male, how it's acceptable to be female. And those are very different for different cultures, which is why understanding your own myths and your archaeology and your archetypes is so important. Because those stories live within your soul. And they're, it's insane how beautifully that they are acted out. In Western culture, you can see the influence of Christianity so clearly. Even there with their inability to reconcile the mother role with the sexuality of women. It's the only mythology where literally the sexuality of the woman and, you know, it's literally Madonna or whore in Christian context. You know, but if you go into Egyptian context, the, the mother archetype is there all the way through. If you go into um, Indian concepts, you literally, the, the idea of sensuality leading to motherhood, leading to more sensuality, to this rightness is right there all the way through. If you go into Buddhism, it's the same thing. They have this concept of the Divine Mother energy and that beautiful rebirthing energy coming through. In Christian culture, we have this division in, in the feminine culture that comes very, very strongly from it not being integrated into our mythology. We have that divide between mother and sensuality um, that's still very much being healed. It's why we struggle with feminine power. Um, it's why we struggle with that literally why this whole force of the law of attraction is a phenomenon in Western culture. Because when they mean the law of attraction, they're talking about the rebirth of divine feminine energy. Because whilst the divine masculine energy is proactive, the divine feminine is attractive. And when I met my soulmate, he used to say to me, you're a distraction, and I used to say to him, no, I'm the attraction. <laughs> because that's what it is. When you're literally in your divine feminine, you are attractive and you are attracting. Like a magnet, you move the different energies inside the room and the spaces around you to bring to you everything that you could desire, just because you are being who you really are. And the Divine Masculine, it's the opposite. It's proactive. So it senses that energy coming through, and it feels moved to take action to then create those phenomena solid, solid, solidly in the world. One is external, one is internal. Both are facets of God. God is outside us and God is inside us. We get very much taught, and this is still the fracture that's in our spiritual culture, we get taught that the divine is within and that the world has no meaning and that it is not real. And that is in part to teach us that we are the creators of this world. To teach us that we are dreaming this world into being. First, we have to literally get rid of the emotional and mental noise to be able to start creating at that level of perception. And that's what those practices enable us to do. The problem then comes if we don't then re-engage with the world from a perspective of unconditional love. Because if we don't start then creating love and creating a loving world and a universe around us, bringing the divine down onto this plane of existence, into the world, into our relationships, into our state of being, then we create a world that isn't very pleasant to be in. We allow things to happen in this world that aren't loving. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard people say to me, but I didn't mean to hurt them. You know, I didn't mean to damage the planet. I didn't mean to screw up. I didn't mean to hurt other people. I didn't, I didn't you know, I just didn't mean it. And the response that comes up inside my soul is, but you didn't mean to love them either. You didn't mean to love the people in your life. You didn't mean to love the planet. You didn't mean to love each other. That wasn't your intention. And that is when the true healing occurs. We are only our true selves when we mean to love each other. That's our intention. Our intention isn't just to get what we need from somebody or to fulfill our relationship. Our intention in every moment becomes to love each other. And that's not to the exclusion of boundaries or accountability. We will get to that too, because it's really important for building trust 
it's really important for, for our own personal and spiritual growth and for our self-actualization. If we are in denial about our own projections, about our own wounds, then we will project them onto our partner. And I have one amazing exercise for you guys to do with that, um, which is delicious amounts of fun. Um, that it's, it's just the way that it happens. The other thing that happens in our culture, because we have no community, because we have a sense of isolation and no emotional or spiritual or even physical accountability to anyone other than our partner, it puts them between a rock and a hard space when it comes to telling us that we're doing something bad. Okay? Ideally, in a romantic relationship, you need to nurture that unconditional positive regard and that mystery. But if that person, if we are so close that we don't get feedback and we aren't working on our own self-growth and our self-awareness in other areas of our lives, then our partner is the one that's kind of left with the job of going, sweetheart, that's destroying you, it's destroying me, and it's destroying your life, so we need to do something about it. Now, the deeper the denial about the issue, the more unconscious you are around it, the more resistance you're going to get. It's like when you try to, when I was a, younger, I was a lifeguard, I, I used to be a swimmer, and um, I always found it absolutely phenomenal that the people I would save would hurt me. They would actually try and drag me underwater with them, and they would drown me. <laughs> they would, they were in the process of trying to save me, they would drown me. Um, and the, twice, literally, I once, um, once when I wasn't doing my lifeguard thing, I was 11 years old, and I was already a very good swimmer at that stage in time. And there was a girl in her, about 19 years old, who couldn't swim. And there was a weird swimming pool that had a very deep hole in the middle. It had like this shallow bit around the side and this massive hole in the middle. And she, it was her first time at the health center, so she just walked right off the edge and down into the three meter deep pool in the middle. And I was sitting on the sun lounger at the time, watching, 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 and thinking, this girl hasn't come up for a while. <coughs> Um, and also at the same time being intimidated by the age thing, I thought, you know, she's older than me, she knows what she's doing, and I'm going to get a walloping if I, you know, act like I think she doesn't know how to do anything. A minute later, she still hasn't come up. And then I go, I, I literally go into the water, stick on my goggles, just, you know, pretending um, to be doing my own thing in case she's in trouble. And she's just literally pale blue, um, floating halfway between the bottom of the pool and the top of the pool. And the moment that I, I went and I put her in the life-saving hold, she started, her whole body started to struggle and she dragged me to the bottom of the pool. And I literally had to push off the bottom, I had to use, the, I still remember having to use my legs, because I was 11, I was really wiry when I was 11. Then I went through a fat stage, we'll get there too. Um, I was really wiry when I was 11, I pushed myself off the bottom of the swimming pool and I managed to get us both to the surface, but I got a black eye out of that. When somebody is in a state of unawareness and you are in the position of rescuing them, and you will be, in, in any spiritual tradition that tells you that you won't be or that you shouldn't be, has never lived on planet Earth, and is completely disconnected from our purpose in being here. We are here to love each other, and we can't do that without occasionally rescuing each other. Um, it's a natural part of life. It's not a sickness. Um, it's, a, it's a part of our connection. Um, but when we're literally, you know, saving somebody, you have to be very, very conscious that the way you approach them sometimes defines your own emotional survival. Because whilst a relationship can be the most beautiful, healing, amazing thing that you will ever experience, and anybody who's ever been in a loving relationship will testify to the power of healing that it has, whether it's a loving friendship, or it's a loving family, or it's a loving relationship with your soulmate, Oh my God, it spreads into every single part of your life. It's all, it's all the time. You, know, you find yourself smiling about it when you're doing the shopping or when you're going through the hardest times. You, know, you find yourself able to laugh at things that used to make you cry. And the thing that we also know, which is why we're going to do the soulmate shadow work, is that when it goes wrong, it goes really, really wrong. And we're talking about statistics at the moment of one in three people living domestic violence wrong. Of when I was in law school, um, literally 85% of murders being committed in families and in intimate relationships. Okay, so we're not talking about it going a little bit wrong, and I'm not gonna. I'm really not going to be um, 
light and fluffy and woo-woo about this, because I think that the lessons that you will learn here this weekend, in this insane room, <laughs> um, in this, literally, the first time this workshop has ever been taught, are probably some of the most valuable and important things that you're going to learn in your life. And I'm genuinely, I'm giving this stuff to you freely, but I'm giving it to you from a very deep space with the desire to end suffering. To end suffering in you. To end suffering in the people who are around you. And when you actually apply the stuff that you're going to be learning this weekend, change will happen and it will happen rapidly. So please, one of the most effective things you can do even when you leave here tonight is teach it to someone. Pick up the phone, talk to a friend about the stuff that you learned here today. You don't even have to say you learned it here. Just talk to them about the principles. But one of the best ways to consolidate things in your own mind is to teach. Get into the habit of literally everything that you learn using proactively in your life within 48 hours minimum. Start the habit of teaching. If you go into Stephen Colby's um, seminar, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, it's the first thing that he teaches, be proactive. And he literally will get everybody in the seminars to teach each other what they've just learned whilst they're inside the seminar. This is of absolutely no use to me, or to you, or to your lover if it stays in your notebook or in your head. It has to be actioned out. You have to practice it. And there are a lot of very dark conversations going on in the name of mental health that have absolutely nothing to do with healing and everything to do with crucifying each other. Okay? So that's the other, the other main thing that we're going to be discussing from seeing the relationship from a spiritual perspective is mercy and kindness. Because when we are intimate together, when we live together, when we share a space, we are going to see the places where each other fail. And that makes sense. Because even if you only, you know, even just during the dating period, and you know, because you're working and you're busy and whatever, you don't see each other's you know, dark sides. And this is the other thing. We go through life stages together. We have parts of ourselves we don't even know were there. And it's hilarious when it comes up, which is something else we're going to be talking about, how your core needs and your core behaviors will change 